and the pyramids and the sphinx. Egyptologists generally agree that the Great Sphinx on the Giza Plateau is approximately 4,500 years old. However, this number is merely a theory and not a fact. In the age of the Sphinx, Robert Bobal, he points out that there is no writings linking the Sphinx to this area in the first place. But when was it actually constructed then? So John Anthony West, he questioned the age of the monument when he observed the vertical weathering on its base. Now this erosion could only have been caused by exposure to water over a long period of time, likely from heavy rainfall. In the middle of the desert though, wondering like where did all this water come from? But interestingly, there was a find that this region actually experienced such rainfall about 10,500 years ago. But that was more than double the currently accepted age of the Sphinx. Robert Boval and another researcher, Graham Hancock, have estimated that the Great Pyramid was built around 10,500 BCE, predating Egyptian civilization. And this begs a question, so who actually constructed it if it wasn't the ancient Egyptians? And what was their purpose for constructing it? Number nine brings us the Maya calendar or the Mayan calendar. There has been such speculation and worry surrounding the prophecies supposedly foretold by the Maya calendar. Now the fears surrounding the predicted catastrophes of the year 2000, of course, they paled in comparison to the concerns surrounding the end of the Mayan long count calendar, which coincides with December 21st, 2012. We all remember that day. The world is gonna end, right? Well, what could it have all meant though? You know, will it bring about the end of the world through some sort of global catastrophe? Or perhaps will it usher in a new era of humanity? Well, these type of prophecies have a long history of failing to materialize. And then what people do is they usually re-explain it, reinterpret it. But either way, 2012 has come and gone. But there are still some people that hold on to the belief that the prophecy was just the beginning of something that is still yet to come. From there, let's take a look at Japan's underwater ruins at number eight. Off the coast of Okinawa, Japan, lie mysterious structures that some believe may have been built by an ancient, now lost civilization. While some have dismissed the tiered formations as being natural occurrences, there was one diver in Okinawa that reported seeing a massive arch or gateway made of expertly fitted stone blocks. And these type of blocks were similar to the prehistoric masonry that was found in the Inca cities of the Andes Mountains. The architecture of these structures included paved streets and crossroads, large altar-like formations, staircases leading to broad plazas, and processional ways crowned with towering features that they say looks like pylons. But if it indeed is a sunken city, it is definitely massive in scale. And some have speculated that it could be the lost civilization of Mu, also known as Lemuria. Coming in at the number seven spot, we have the Egyptian treasures. The Arizona Gazette's April 5th, 1909 edition featured an article titled Explorations in Grand Canyon. Remarkable finds indicate ancient people migrated from Orient. And this revealed that a Smithsonian funded expedition had discovered artifacts that could revolutionize history if they're confirmed. So the artifacts they found inside the cave, which was manually carved into solid rock, included things like copper weapons, statues of Egyptian deities and mummies, as well as hieroglyphic tablets. Despite the article's detailed account, the legitimacy of the story is in question as the cave has still not been found since. As well as the Smithsonian, they deny knowledge of this discovery completely. However, one researcher and explorer, David Hatcher Childress, he suggests that the front page coverage and Smithsonian's mention increase the likelihood of its validity. 
So it may have been a newspaper hoax, but the story's level of detail makes it hard to just dismiss it as being completely fake. Maybe it does exist. Maybe extraordinary things were found, but that's probably a secret that we may never know. From there, let's move on to the Cuban sunken ship at number six. In May of 2001, an ocean mapping project by Advanced Digital Communications, or ADC, which is a Canadian company, made a discovery in Cuba's territorial waters. Sonar readings revealed a geometric pattern of stones 2,200 feet beneath the surface that appeared to be the ruins of a city. Now, a man, Paul Weinzweig of ADC, he said this, and I quote, what we have here is a mystery. Nature couldn't have built anything so symmetrical. This isn't natural, but we don't know what it is. Also, National Geographic, they became interested in the site and joined in subsequent investigation. Also, ADC's Paulina Zelinsky, she reported that they saw a structure that, and I quote, looks like it could have been a large urban center. However, it would be totally irresponsible to say what it was before we have evidence. Coming up in at the number five spot, we have the Nazca Lines. The famous Nazca Lines are located in a desert about 200 miles south of Lima, Peru. Etched on a plain approximately 37 miles long, and one mile wide. These lines and figures have definitely confounded the scientific world since their discovery back in the 1930s. Running perfectly straight, some parallel to each other and many intersecting, they give the appearance of ancient airport runways when viewed from above. Now, in his book, Chariots of the Gods, Eric von Daniken, he proposed that the lines were actually runways for extraterrestrial crafts. However, that's kind of unlikely that aliens would need runways on Earth. Either way, more captivating though are the gigantic figures of over 70 animals carved into the ground, including a monkey, a spider, and a hummingbird, as well as others. And the question is, what is their significance anyways? Some experts believe that they have astronomical purposes, while others think that they were used for different religious ceremonies. But Again, who really knows? Number four leads us to the underwater pyramids. Dr. Ray Brown's account of discovering the ruins of a lost civilization is very fascinating. Back in 1970, while diving near the Bari Islands in Bahamas, he claimed to have stumbled upon a pyramid that was shining like a mirror. That was his words. He estimated its height to be around 120 feet, although he could only see the top 90 feet. Now the pyramid had a colored capstone and it was surrounded by the ruins of other buildings. Dr. Brown, he swam into a chamber and found a crystal held by two metallic hands. And above the crystal hung a brass rod from the center of the ceiling at the end of which was a red multifaceted gem of some kind. Dr. Brown, he claimed to have taken the crystal, which is believed to have mystical powers. And his account may seem a little too over the top to be true though, but it definitely does spark the imagination about the many mysteries that may still be waiting to be discovered. For the number three spot, let's talk about the journey to America. It's definitely a common misconception that Christopher Columbus discovered America. But in reality, he merely began the official European invasion of the Americas. People had already discovered the continent long before Columbus, including the arrival of what we now call Native Americans many centuries prior. Even explorers from other civilizations beat Columbus to the shores of the Americas, such as Leif Erikson, who successfully sailed to North America back in the year 1000. But what's even more fascinating is the discovery of artifacts suggesting that ancient cultures explored the continent way before any of these people, Columbus, Erickson. For example, Greek and Roman coins and pottery have been found in the US and Mexico, while Egyptian statues of Isis and Osiris were also found in Mexico. These discoveries are in addition to others such as ancient Hebrew and Asian artifacts that have been found in the Americas. How did they get here and who were the explorers that either brought them 
or traveled to distant lands and brought them back. Still a mystery. Next up at number two, the legend of Mu. Mu is also known as Lemuria, and it's a well-known legendary lost world that has captured the imaginations of people for centuries. According to many specific According to many Pacific Island traditions, Mu was once a paradise located somewhere in the Pacific, but it sank into the depths of the ocean along with its inhabitants. Like the myth of Atlantis, there is an ongoing debate about the existence of Mu and its exact location. In the 1800s, Madame Elena Petrovna Blavatsky, the founder of the Theosophy movement, believed it was located in the Indian Ocean. But again, still a mystery. Ending this episode off at number one, where is Atlantis? The myth of Atlantis originated from the writings of Plato in 370 BC, describing a magnificent and technologically advanced island, but providing only limited and vague details about its whereabouts. So many believed it to be nothing more than just a legend though. However, those convinced of Atlantis's existence have scoured the globe for evidence or even hints of its existence. Edgar Cayce's prophecies suggest that remnants of Atlantis would be discovered around Bermuda. And in 1969, geometric stone formations were found near Bimini that some said was actually confirmation of these predictions of Edgar Cayce. Other people proposed different locations for Atlantis, including Antarctica, Mexico, off the coast of England, and off the coast of Cuba. Some also claimed that Atlantis was not an island, but it was actually an exploded planet. But either way, this is a secret that has eluded people for centuries. The discovery of King Tut's tomb. This tomb was unearthed in 1922 by a team that was led by Howard Carter, and the tomb was filled with a lot of different treasures, including King Tut, or as he was known as King Tutankhamun's death mask, which today is very, very, very iconic. Google his name, and that's the first thing you see. Now, King Tut was known as the Boy King, but he ended up dying in his teens. And the analysis that they did of his remains, it suggests that he actually suffered from a variety of different health problems, and he used to actually walk around with a cane. He spent a lot of his time ruling Egypt between the years 1332 BC and 1323 BC, trying to really restore Egypt's traditional polytheistic religion. And this was something actually that was interrupted by his father, Akhenaten, who started to promote the supremacy of the Aten, which is the sun disk. And that religion, by the way, is actually known as Atenism. Next up, we have the Rosetta Stone. Very, very, very popular. This dates back to 196 BC. And this Rosetta Stone, it contains a decree that was written by a group of priests that mentions the right of Pharaoh Ptolemy V, who was 13 years old at the time, to rule Egypt. So the decree was written in three different languages. We have hieroglyph, then there is Demotic and Greek. Now, when the stone was discovered in the year 1799, only the Greek language was known, but because the Greek text it had the exact same decree as the other two languages, it really helped scientists and researchers to decipher those languages and what they had to say. And since nobody speaks those languages anymore, having the Greek language was really, really, really good in the interpretation of a language like hieroglyphic. Oxyrhynchus papyri comes in at number eight. Yeah, kind of a weird word. But between the years 1896 and 1907, archaeologists Bernard Grenfell and Arthur Hunt discovered over 500,000 papyri fragments that date back around 1800 years. So this investigation, it found many different fragments in the ruins of Oxyrhynchus, which was a large ancient town in southern Egypt that really began to flourish at the time when the Roman Empire actually controlled Egypt. Now, because of the condition 
conditions in the town, the papyri used by the residents were able to survive nearly two millennia. The papyri included Christian gospels as well as magic spells and also a wrestling match contract. As a matter of fact, one of these spells that was written on the papyri was meant to invoke the gods to burn the heart of a woman until she fell in love with the person that casted the spell. This, by the way, was according to Franco Maltomini of the University of Udine in Italy. Next up at number seven, we have the Khufu ship. This ship is a discovery of ancient Egypt and it was discovered by an Egyptian archaeologist named Kamal al Malak in the year 1954. Now this was hidden with other grave goods as they were called. Egyptians had collected these things and they were used for the afterlife. Now this boat vessel was reconstructed using cedar wood from Lebanon and is currently on display in the Geezer Solar Boat Museum. Now the Khufu ship is one of the oldest, largest and best preserved vessels from ancient times. The measurements of this, well, it measures 43.6 meters, which is 143 feet long, and 5.9 meters or 19.5 feet wide. Pretty big boat. Continuing to number six, we have the tomb KV-5. In 1995, excavations at KV-5 revealed that the little studied tomb was actually the largest ever constructed in the Valley of the Kings. So as excavation continued, reports suggested that archeologists had found 121 corridors and chambers in the tomb. And the researchers said that they think more than 150 will eventually be found. Archeologists found that the tomb was used to bury the sons of Pharaoh, Ramses II, who we'll talk about later on in this episode, as a matter of fact. And at least six royal sons are known to be placed in KV-5. Continuing now to number five. This discovery is the Bastet Temple. Now this 2,200 year old temple is believed to have been dedicated to an ancient Egyptian cat goddess named Bastet. And this was discovered in Alexandria, Egypt. Mohammed Abdel Maksud, which is the Egyptian archeologist who led the excavation team, he said that this discovery may be the first trace of the long sought location of Alexandria's royal quarter. And because of the large number of statues depicting Bastet that were found in the ruins, he said that it suggests that this this may be the first Ptolemaic era temple dedicated to the cat goddess to be discovered in Alexandria. So yep, there could be several more. Now this would indicate that the worship of an ancient Egyptian deity actually continued during the later years when the Greek had a lot of influence in Egypt during the Ptolemaic period. Next up at number four, we have the Valley of the Golden Mummies. This is a very interesting one. So after intensive excavations were going down, Egyptian archeologists, they released some details of what is described as one of the most spectacular discoveries in Egypt in recent decades. Never before have such a number of mummies been found in a single site in Egypt. And those were the words by Dr. Zahi Hawass, who is the director of the Baharia Excavations, and he said this in an interview. Now, in some of the tombs that were explored, archaeologists, they counted over a hundred mummies of men, children and women. They say that entire families actually appeared together and some of the bodies were wrapped in plain linen, but others were decorated with masks and painted scenes of cartonage, which is made of linen and papyrus that served as a mummy case. But they said that no two mummy decorations were the exact same. And I guess there's no indication as to why some of them were covered in just plain linen while others had decorated designs on them. Number three leads us to the Silver King. In the year 1939, archeologist Pierre Montet, he discovered the tomb of Susanis I, who was a pharaoh who ruled Egypt around 3,000 years ago. And his burial chamber was located in Tanis, which is a city on the Nile Delta. This particular pharaoh was buried in a coffin that was made of silver and he was wearing a golden burial mask. Now, Susanese the first is sometimes called the Silver King because of his silver coffin. Susanese the first, he was a chief priest of the sun god Amun-Ra at Tanis and his family lineage can be traced back to the great pharaoh 
Ramses the first. And by the way, Susanese, if you're wondering, that name there, it means the star appearing in the city. Getting down to the last two discoveries. Coming in at number two, we have the Pyramid Town at Giza. Since the year 1988, there's a team of archaeologists from the AERA or the Ancient Egyptian Research Associates and they've been excavating a town near the Pyramid of Mankara on the Giza Plateau. And this pyramid for the Pharaoh Mankara who reigned from roughly the years 2490 BC to 2472 BC was the last of the pyramids constructed at Giza. And the people who lived at Giza would have actually been involved, heavily involved in building this pyramid. The discoveries made at this town include barracks for soldiers, as well as a giant house for senior officials. And also a discovery was made of a port that was used to import goods. These discoveries provide a lot of information about the people who built the pyramids, as well as the logistics and the thought process behind pyramid construction. Even details of what the people were fed during the construction of the pyramid. So a whole lot of information came out of this. And as you can imagine, a whole new world of discovery and research opened up. And the final discovery I'm gonna share in this episode is the discovery of Ramses II. He was the third king of the 19th dynasty that reigned between the years 1292 and 1190 BC of the ancient Egyptians who reigned from 1279 to 13 BC. And that, by the way, was the second longest ruling dynasty in Egyptian history. Ramses II was known for his extensive building programs and initiatives and for many of the massive statues of him that were found all over. Egypt. He's probably one of the most widely known pharaohs, even to people who aren't even interested in learning about ancient Egypt. Either way though, the tomb is not the longest tomb of any of the kings that were found in the Valley of the Kings, but it's probably the largest when it comes to area. It covers more than 820 square meters, which is 8,800 square feet. And by the way, one thing to mention was that uh, papyrus actually indicated that there was a robbery of Ramesses tomb and this dates back to the 28th year of the reign of Ramses III. Now the mummy of Ramses II was not found in its tomb though. It was first removed to the tomb of his father's KV-17 during ancient times and then it was moved to Deir el-Bahari where it was discovered in the year 1881. Pretty magnificent that the pharaoh wasn't even found in the tomb. Either way though, the identity of the pharaoh in the story of Moses and the Exodus recorded in the Bible and the Quran has been a subject of a lot of debate, but many scholars do accept that it was King Ramses II who ruled at that time. And that's what makes this discovery so surprising and amazing. The Nile River is considered the second largest river in the entire world, coming in at a total length of 6,853 kilometers long. Now, of course, there's been a lot of arguments between whether or not the Nile is longer or whether or not the Amazon River is longer, but they're actually pretty close to each other. And although for some they may believe the Amazon River is longer, the Nile River is actually one of the most important rivers in all of human history. The reason for this is because most Egyptian cities in not just the modern world, but also during the ancient Egyptian times, are currently or were constructed along the riverbed within Egypt, and thus in history it helped us create civilization, which has been built up to the modern world we know today. And with that in mind, let's take a look at the GDP. Now, for these videos, we like to use the purchasing power parity because it's a great way to compare nations. Now, for Egypt's GDP purchasing power parity, it sits at approximately 1.201 trillion dollars. Now that's just a 2017 estimate, but it currently ranks 21st in the world when it comes to GDP. So that's pretty good. As for the GDP per capita though, this is where it becomes a little bit of a problem. As the per capita lists Egypt having approximately $12,671 per person, making it sit at about a hundredth in the world, and that's something that they're greatly trying to improve. And to go further into this GDP, we need to look at the exports of the country. 
For example, the exports of Egypt sit at approximately $27.7 billion, ranking 59th in the world. Now, the biggest thing that Egypt exports is obviously crude petroleum, which sits at approximately 14%. But let's not forget good old-fashioned Egyptian gold, which makes up 10% of all the exports within the country. And those two are just like the obvious exports that people think of when you think of Egypt. Because for some people in the world, they may not think that agriculture is actually a big thing, partially because they've probably seen a lot of movies of Egypt and they think, well, it's maybe just a big, you know, dry desert sort of country. And although they say that the desert makes up about 90% of all of Egypt, they are actually the largest producers and cultivators for dates out of any country in the world. And as for figs, they stand at second in the world. However, they also sit at fourth in the world for strawberries, onions, buffalo milk, and eggplants. And actually, when it comes to your tomatoes and watermelons, a lot of people actually get these from Egypt because, well, they sit at fifth in the world. And for its agriculture, it actually makes up over 29% of the workforce. And oddly enough, out of all the Arab countries, Egypt is one country that isn't dependent on as much oil as the others. As a matter of fact, in 2018, it had the largest GDP that was non-oil based out of all the Arab countries. So there you go, guys. As much as you may think it's just oil coming from Egypt and that they have no agriculture, eh, we're a little bit wrong on that one. Now let's quickly jump over to imports because they sit at approximately 60 $8.2 billion, ranking 42nd in the world. Now, the largest thing that they import is refined petroleum and petrol gas, with a total of 9.9% of its imports. But also, Egypt is a huge importer of wheat, which makes up about 4% of its imports. As a matter of fact, Egypt has such strong relations with the United States when it comes to wheat that they are the largest wheat market for the United States, coming in at a total of $1 billion, which has the United States supplying up to 46% of all of Egypt's wheat needs. Now for this economy, it is all under supervision from a unitary semi-presidential government, which means they actually have a president and a prime minister. I did not know that. With the current president of the country being Abdel Fattah al-Sisi and the prime minister being Mustafa Madbouli. And of course, at the height of this all, the capital of the entire country is, you probably guessed it, Cairo. Now, Cairo itself is one of the largest cities in not only Egypt, but the African continent, and it's considered the 15th largest city in the entire world. Now, modern Cairo was founded in 969 AD by the Fatimid dynasty. But however, the ground of which the new city stands was at one point major spots of ancient Egyptian culture. For example, Old Cairo predates the Fatimid dynasty, and because of its great history, it's not only one of the world's oldest Arabic cities, but it's also been designated a World Heritage Site since 1979. So of course, when we talk about heritage and Egypt, we gotta mention the fact that it has a lot of it, like a lot of heritage. As during the height of the ancient world, it was a pinnacle for multiple accomplishments for humanity. And what I mean by that, for example, is they are still trying to figure out how they actually built the pyramids. I mean, they have really a kind of good guesses, but truthfully, some scientists are going, we still don't really know. But one thing that's very interesting about its history is their artifacts. And for example, let's take the oldest piece of clothing that was worn by a human being, which was found in Egypt. Now, this was more or less a dress than any random piece of clothing that is known as the Tarkhan dress. And it was discovered in 913 AD and is approximately over 5,000 years old and is currently at the University College of London. Now, Egypt is a very, very big and defined country, but if you go down to the southern area of the border, you'll notice that its border is dotted instead of straight. And this particular dotted region on the border is very well known, known as Bur Tawil, and it is a section between Egypt and Sudan that has not been claimed by either countries. Being 2,060 kilometers square, it is different from the Triangle Territory to the right, known as the Halaib Triangle, which has a land size of approximately 20,580 kilometers square. Now, as for the Halaib Triangle, it is one area that is actually disputed between these two countries, as it was an administrative boundary set by the British in 1902. And currently for this region, Egypt asserts its political boundary, while Sudan has administrative boundary. So basically, there's a lot of confusion of who kind of owns this area going back and forth between the two countries. But as for Berta Wheel off to the left, it is the only region on earth that is considered habitable that is not claimed by any known government. 
Now, one thing that we all know about the history of Egypt is that they were really great builders and artists. But one thing that is not really talked about when it comes to the history of Egypt is how the Egyptians created what is considered the first real synthetic pigment. Now, it is known as Egyptian blue, and it is seen in many drawings on the walls and hieroglyphics. And for this particular type of pigment, it was used for thousands of years. It is also known as calcium copper silicate, and although more popularly known as Egyptian blue, especially by the English since its term was coined in 1809, some people also call it cerulean. And lastly, guys, this is the fact that I was telling you about earlier, the one that totally blew me away, the one that I think you guys might get blown away by, and that is that the Statue of Liberty in America was not originally going to go to America, but was actually going to go to Egypt. That is right, the original sketches for the Statue of Liberty didn't have her designed as a Roman woman, but as a Muslim woman in a veil. This is because the original sculptor, Frederick Auguste Bartholdi, originally intended to have the Statue of Liberty be a beacon that was guarding the newly designed Suez Canal, which opened in 1869. And at that time, it was going to be known as Egypt carving the light to Asia. However, unfortunately, Egypt actually rejected this plan outright and instead he decided to pitch it towards the Americans and change the Muslim look of what is now known as the Statue of Liberty to a Roman looking woman. This fact about Egypt that a lot of people don't know is that the Egyptian people are the ones who invented the 365 day calendar. The ancient Egyptians actually invented the 365 days a year calendar to predict the yearly floodings of the Nile River. In addition to the civil calendar, the ancient Egyptians simultaneously maintained a second calendar based upon the phase of the moon. It seems like Egyptians had a hobby for creating calendars. Not too sure why, but hey, at least they give us a reason to celebrate New Year's every year. Another thing that most people don't know about Egypt is that it receives more than 3,451 hours of sun each year. Aswan, which is a city in Egypt, is the third sunniest place in the whole world with about 3,863 hours of sun each year. That's like 10 hours of sun a day. So if you guys are looking for a good 10, you already know where to go. The ancient Egyptians enjoyed passing their time playing board games. In fact, there were a number of board games like Mehen and Mankala, but the most popular was Sinet. It was a hieroglyphic board game played in ancient Egypt as far back as 3100 BC. Even Tutankhamun had a copy of the Sinet board in his tomb, untouched for about 3000 years until modern archaeologists found it. So when Egyptians weren't making calendars, apparently they were playing board games? So Egyptian hieroglyphics were the formal writing method used by the ancient Egyptians. It was a writing system that was basically a combination of icons and native alphabetical elements. We're so used to a writing system based on 26 letters today, but ancient Egyptian writers used more than 2,000 hieroglyphic characters used to represent common objects from daily life. My ancestors out here killing it with 2,000 characters and I stutter on every other word that I speak. This is great guys, I'm so honored. Make sure to watch the whole video to find out the most <laughs> the most surprising. So in Egypt, both men and women wore eye makeup called kohel, which was made from ground up raw material mixed with oil. They believed it had magical healing powers that could restore poor eyesight and fight eye infections. I've been wearing eyeliner for my whole life and I still have negative 20 vision, so not too sure how well that worked out for them, but props for being innovative. Another thing that not many people know about Egypt is that it is actually home to a number of famous sports players, including professional football player Mohamed Salah, who plays as a forward for Premier League club Liverpool, and the Egyptian national national team and is considered one of the best football players in the world, as well as Nur Sherbini who is the youngest woman to win the Women's World Championship in squash. Sherbini has had many titles and wins under her belt, most impressive among them being the Women's World Championship title that she earned in April 2016 and retained again in April 2017. Guys, I really need to try and keep up with these successful Egyptians, I gotta keep our reputation up. Other than its famous athletes, Egypt is also known for its famous actors, as Egypt has a flourishing film industry based in Cairo. Since 1970s, the capital has held the annual Cairo International Film Festival, which has been accredited by the International Federation of Film Producers Associations. The 1940s to 1960s are considered the golden age of Egyptian cinema. Until the late 1950s, it was impossible to differentiate between Egyptian, American, Italian, and French films. However, the nationalization of Egyptian film industry carried out in 1961 by the Nasser regime, who gave room for both big directors and young artistic new talents, and enabled big productions that have allowed Egypt to now be pronounced 
once the Hollywood of Middle East. Something that most people don't know about Egyptians is that the Egyptians saw animals as incarnations of the gods and were one of the first civilizations to keep household pets. Egyptians were particularly fond of cats, which were associated with the goddess Basta, but they also had a reverence for hawks, dogs, lions, and baboons. Many of these animals held a special place in the Egyptian home and they were often mummified and buried with their owners after they died. The medicine of the ancient Egyptians is some of the oldest documented. From the beginnings of the civilization, the Egyptian medical practice was highly advanced for its time, including simple, non invasive surgery, the setting of bones, and dentistry. The Egyptian medical thought later influenced other traditions, including the Greeks. So, my people are out here healing everyone. Okay, guys, so now we're down to the last fact about Egypt and Egyptians. So, it is known that the ancient Egyptians actually sanctified humor to the extent that they even consigned a humor goddess and married her to the deity of wisdom. It is said that ancient Egyptians believed that the world was created out of laughter. In fact, it is even claimed that when the Romans ruled Egypt, they forbade Egyptian lawyers from accessing Alexandria's courts because they used to laugh at the Roman judges and their poor verdicts and make jokes and songs to defend political prisoners. I swear we're the only ones to be kicked out for laughing too much. You can ask my local librarian, it's true. <laughs>